that is the most letters from any saint. Like, was the 7,000 from St. Ignatius. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just struck by the (laughs) historical... (laughs) The lag is brutal. eh? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think we are still on a bit of a lag, but we'll just... Yeah. I guess we'll just pause and we'll do our best and I'll... I can certainly do things um, in post post production too, and in the meantime, okay. we'll try to figure it out for next week. We'll see. Okay. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 130. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay, and today we are talking about the discernment process. Author and speaker John C. Maxwell once said, quote, Life is a matter of choices, and every choice you make makes you, end quote. So, no pressure. But it is true that over the course of our lives, we will have to make a multitude of decisions, ranging from the small and inconsequential to the big and life-altering. And when it comes to those major life decisions, we can take comfort in knowing that we do have tools at our disposal to learn the skill of proper discernment to set us off on the right path. But first, the best way that you can support the Modern Lady Podcast is by giving us a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews, especially on iTunes, can really help others who might be interested find our podcast too. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to listener Marie at Little Picks and Clips, who joined Lindsay and the team at Many Hail Marys at a Time to pray the rosary two weeks ago, and who commented on our Instagram page, quote, Thank you for joining at Many Hail Marys at a Time today, Lindsay. I listened to your imagination podcasts and enjoyed them so much. I will tune in again. Is there a place where you keep your show notes? I want to know the names of the shows you're enjoying, end quote. Well, thank you so much, Marie, for tuning in and welcome to the Modern Lady community. We are so happy that you're enjoying the episode so far, and we thought this was a great opportunity to remind everyone that our show notes can be found on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, and we update it weekly with our What We're Loving links and sometimes some key articles or resources that we've used for our episodes in case you want to dig deeper. At our website, you can also leave us a message in the comment section or send us an email, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. There are a few attainable luxuries that I love. Fine dining and nice hotels are at the top of my list, but my favorite treat is champagne. The real stuff, not sparkling white wine masquerading as champagne, the real deal from the historical province of Champagne in France. We treat ourselves to a few bottles a year and we collect the corks writing on them with black Sharpie, the thing that we are celebrating and the year. We have collected these corks in a glass vase and we hope that one day, long after we are gone, our children will read each one and know that we did our best to mark as special the moments of great joy that we have had in our marriage. Now, if you have the streaming channel called BBC Select, you can watch a special they have on there called Jennifer and Joanna, Absolutely Champers, starring Jennifer Saunders and Joanna Lumley, who played the champagne-loving best friends on the long-running British comedy Absolutely Fabulous. In this special, the two travel to the Champagne region of France and visit some of the exclusive wineries and find out all about Champagne. They even visit the church where Dom Perignon is buried. Yes, he was a real man, a French Benedictine monk who pretty much invented Champagne. Now there was something I noticed while watching this program and then saw the same thing again when watching something else where Champagne was being served in a very high-end restaurant. And what I noticed was this. They didn't actually tip the glasses at an angle when filling them, and so 75% of the glass was filled with foam before it settled. I didn't think that this could be proper, but what do I know? So let us learn proper champagne etiquette together. According to the website vinovest.com, you start by opening the bottle correctly. Now, I've encountered many friends who are nervous about opening a champagne bottle, so here are some tips. 
Hold the bottle at a 45 degree angle and then with your other hand, tear off the foil around the bottle's neck. Then you remove the metal cage that is holding down the cork. Then hold a napkin or a dish towel as I use over the cork to prevent it from shooting off. Have a napkin close by before you open it and then slowly twist the bottle and not the cork until the cork pops. It will pop into a napkin. Before you pour, continue to hold the bottle at a 45 degree angle for a few seconds as the pressure releases. Now here's what I wanted to know. Do you tip the glass when pouring champagne? This website said yes. Yet, the photo attached to this stage in their article shows the opposite. It shows someone pouring it into a few glasses sitting on a table and not being held at all. I'm still confused. So now I've turned to Harper's Bazaar, and here's what they have to say. They agree that preserving the integrity of the bubbles starts as soon as you open it. They said that you do not want a fizzy faux pas. (laughs) They also said that champagne bottles shouldn't actually pop. They should whisper. Now, they didn't actually weigh in on whether the glass should be tilted or not, but they did stress that the flow should be slow and steady as this will encourage the bubbles to collect around the sides and settle before you finish pouring. Finally, this article from Harper's Bazaar said that filling the glasses only two-thirds of the way full is not stingy, but it is a sign that you are cultivated. A fuller glass makes it near impossible to properly inhale the aromas. So fill the glasses only two thirds full and wait for a little bit before you take your first sip so that the flavors unfold. But alas, I still don't know if I should tilt the glass. I turn now to foodandwine.com, a source that I trust, and they explain that there are differing viewpoints on this technique, but they were interviewing Catherine Coker, who is the head of the wine program at Esther's Wine Bar in LA, which has been called the best wine bar in Southern California. So I guess she knows her stuff. Well, Coker said that while bartenders will tilt the glass as they would when pouring beer, she doesn't do that. She is clear that that is not the correct way. She pours the champagne into a glass sitting flat on a surface and she tries to make sure that she is pouring the liquid against the side of the glass, which helps the bubbles dissipate. You pour it slowly and then stop and pour it again and then stop. Next week, we will find out just how chilled champagne should be, why there is a hollow at the bottom of the bottle, and if flutes really are the proper champagne glass. Mm-hmm. I often wonder if the danger of champagne is part of the taste appeal, <laughs> like of popping <laughs> the bottle and waiting for it to explode everywhere is part of the whole experience of champagne. But um, yeah, you're right. I do often pour any kind of carbonated drinks against the side of a glass. And I don't think I would have even questioned whether you would not do that with champagne if it hadn't been for your tip today. <laughs> And speaking of dangerous, um, (laughs) Jason did nearly die once opening champagne. Um, And so I actually Googled how many people die opening champagne every year. And I forget this was a couple years ago. I think it's around 35 people die every year opening a bottle of champagne. Our problem was he had recorked some um, with a special cork Mm -hmm. we have. You're not really supposed to do that. And the pressure had built up so much so that when he recorked it, it was like ready to burst. So it was when he opened it a second time, that cork flew off, narrowly missing his face. It would have gone off like a gunshot, uh, which it did. It smashed into our ceiling. So yeah, be careful living on the edge with your champagne. (laughs) Sometimes it feels like our lives are at a constant crossroads and having to make decisions takes up so much of our time and mental energy. And when those decisions are important or life-shaping, the process seems that much more daunting. But good news, there is a virtue that we can develop that helps with that. Right, Lindsay? Yes, that's right, Michelle. Discernment, something that you and I have been talking a lot about lately. Um, You know, we've been talking about it in terms of schooling, right? homeschooling versus Mm -hmm. um, sending the kids out to school, even though this year's wrapping up, it feels Mm -hmm. like that's something on a lot of moms' minds, right? Leading into the summer. Um, We're discerning 
moves like real estate (laughs) in our house, like a bunch of things. And one thing in particular is even this podcast, like we're finishing up our fourth year here and it's been incredible and it keeps getting better. But you and I are both in different seasons of life than we were when we first started it. And so it's this constant pull of this is something we enjoy. This is something that, you know, gives us life. And, and it's something that we are happy to share with everybody. And it seems like the response has been so great, but is it what we're called to do right now? And that's something that we had to like kind of figure out and how do we figure that out? Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of all, I feel like this whole need for discernment has kind of caught up with us in a way because the world has changed so much, like not even in the last couple of years, which could be its own whole, <laughs> whole subject on its own. But even over the course of the podcast so far, like it's been four years, like you said, um, my goodness, from where we are now to what everything was like back then, so much has changed. But um, because of all the constant adapting and flexibility and uncertainty of the last two years, I know for my part, I feel like I haven't given much time to discern much of anything at all. It's just been kind of like going with the flow or survival mode or any combination of the two. And I think many of us are feeling that. So like as we're as we are gearing up for this break in particular, I think some of those backlogged decisions are starting to come to the forefront. And so, yeah, this is what prompted our conversation about like, oh, how do we make decisions again? Like it's been so long since we've even felt like we've had much option <laughs> in anything. So it it was an interesting coming back around to the topic of discernment. What is proper discernment? Why it's necessary to actually follow a process um, and to do it properly and to give it its proper due and credence. I love that you said backlogged. I think you're so right because mm-hmm. I know in my family, we have been pushing down decisions that we needed to make because you're just trying to get through the everyday, right? Very much the living in the moment, yeah. but you can't fully avoid that whispering in your heart of going, no, you have to actually make some bigger decisions right now, but we just kept pushing it down, just kept pushing it down. And you're right. They become backlogged and it's, I can't ignore it anymore. And so, but we want to make sure we make decisions that are rooted in wisdom, that they are prudent, that Mm -hmm. they are considerate of everybody. Right. Um, We don't Mm -hmm. want to like some of these things are big decisions that will impact the way my family moves for the next five, 10 years. And so we thought, surely there's a, there's a framework here. Surely there's some kind of um, outline um, and, and jumping off point. And of course, I'm always trying to reinvent the wheel. And then I always remember, wait a second, <laughs> I bet you the church has something <laughs> to say on this. And sure enough, there's this incredible framework that was written like 600 years ago. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's just as applicable today. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go back in time then. Now, a couple minutes ago, I estimated the math, which I'm terrible at, at around 600 years ago. I just quickly used a calculator, Michelle. So <laughs> I was 100 years off. Okay. So this comes from about 500 years ago. So let's go back 500 okay. years. I'll admit that St. Ignatius is not a saint that I am familiar with and really never felt like the pull to look into his life. But wow, was I missing out, which is Mm. the case with every saint that I think, oh, I don't need to know about them. (laughs) But no, turns out, (laughs) turns out there's a reason they were canonized. So again, trusting in the church. Mm. Um, So Inigo Mm -hmm. de Loyola was born in northern Spain in 1491. He was the youngest of 13 children, and his family was considered middle nobility. When he was 16, he got a job in the royal court at Castile, and it was here that he developed a taste for the material world, and that was from Jesuits.org. And it was noted on court documents that he was arrested for fighting. So he liked, he was wild and (laughs) fighting and into glamour and clothing and just a very secular life. Now, he joined the Spanish army, which resulted in his leg being shattered by a cannonball. He wanted his leg to heal nicely so that it looked nice in tights. <laughs> so they rebroke it and he <laughs> spent a full year in recovery. I also want my legs to look nice in tights. I totally get that. 
I was going to say, that's one of my favorite parts of this whole story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, the whole tights thing, yeah. <laughs> now, during that time, the only books available to him were on the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. He went from being a lover of books on chivalry and the knighthood to becoming entranced by the heroic actions of the saints. So just like us, he thought, oh, these lives, it's probably boring, don't need to read them. But then he started reading them. And he's like, these are just as exciting as the knights. Again, this, this, is, this just is so similar 500 years later for us. Now, these books on the lives of the saints mm-hmm. and on the life of Christ, they left him feeling consoled and joyful versus the emptiness he used to feel reading secular stories. Now, Inigo started drawing closer and closer to God. And in 1522, he was well enough to leave home and fulfill his new desire to serve God. Now, he went to a shrine of Our Lady and he spent all night in prayer there. In the morning, he left his sword at the altar and gave his nice clothing away to a poor man. Anigo, or Ignatius, as we now know him, began his life as a poor pilgrim and moved into a cave in the town of Manresa, Spain. There he started writing, and one of his greatest works, a work still beloved today, was written, The Spiritual Exercises. Then Ignatius felt a calling to the priesthood, but his education was lacking. He had to take Latin classes alongside little children. (laughs) He then went on to the University of Paris and shared his spiritual exercises with his classmates. His roommates at university ended up founding the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit Society, and all three became canonized saints. All three roommates, which is just (laughs) wild. Um, The other two being St. Francis Xavier and St. Peter Faber. On Christmas morning, 1538, Ignatius offered his first mass as a priest in Rome. Just two years later, Pope Paul III made the society an official religious order in the Catholic Church. Ignatius died on July 31st after suffering from stomach ailments for years. His feast day is celebrated on the date of his death, July 31st. Fun fact! (laughs) St. Ignatius wrote over 7,000 letters in his lifetime. Wow. And I think I was reading somewhere that that is the most letters from any saint, like was the 7,000 from St. Ignatius. Wow. I'm so struck also by the historical context of St. Ignatius's life, like when you put him into history there, um, reading that it was right at the end of the medieval period, leaning into the Renaissance, right at the discovery and revelation of the new world. Like there must have been so much happening and so much change happening. And I can only imagine if those people had social media back then, like maybe they would feel like some of the information overload that we feel with all the massive change happening today. So it's just, it's so amazing that God would inspire a would-be saint, Saint Ignatius, to specifically dig deeper into this subject of discernment and interior life. Like it's just so providential. And there would have been a need in humanity to counter the huge changes and the indecision or uncertainty that may have been brought. And so enter Saint Ignatius and discernment. Um, and that also just makes sense why it resonates still with us today. Um, it's really enjoying a bit of a renaissance or resurgence of attention on its own in our times right now. So I have a fun fact too, though, just before we leave St. Ignatius, I was reading a story. (laughs) Um, He once allowed a donkey, allegedly, allegedly the story goes, he once allowed um, the donkey on which he was riding to determine whether he should follow a path to um, murder somebody he thought had insulted the Blessed Virgin Mary or the other road not. (laughs) And fortunately, the donkey chose the path that led away from the insulter. And I'm going to assume this happened before he really started to develop his (laughs) theology on (laughs) discernment. (laughs) 
And what a step up from donkey decision making is what I'm trying to say. Like we're we're going to level up with St. Ignatius here for the rest of this episode. Okay. So he was probably like, I feel like I need to create a method for discernment. Like maybe I'll try a few different techniques here. Right. And he's like probably doing like a pros con list. And he's like, yes. maybe like, like doing a little bit of evaluating the environment around him. Like just a couple different things. And they thought, you know, I'll try this thing with the donkey. Right. <laughs> Because thankfully he does refine this a lot and, and he does get to the point where he's like proper discernment in the case that we're going to talk about today. And again, we'll get more into this is a, is between goods, not a good and an evil. So he does, he does move forward with wisdom. (laughs) And so let's, let's now move away from the donkey and we're going to go actually to a resource that you and I both found really comprehensive and really did a good job of outlining so much of this Ignatian spirituality of decision making and a lot of this is found at a website called marquette.edu and so what we're going to do is like we tried to kind of summarize things but they're in such like clip size like bite size packs a punch Um, pieces of writing that we're just going to read our favorite excerpts and then we're going to talk about them. Right, Lindsay? So you have the first um, section that we really bolded and highlighted all about like the underlying, uh, I guess, stipulations when it comes to Ignatius's discernment process. Yes, that's right. Um, So again, this is from Marquette University and their website is marquette.edu. And yeah, so I'm going to read directly from what they've written. And this first part is about Ignatian assumptions underpinning his guidelines. So we're going to start at the very beginning here. And it says, Ignatius assumes in his discernment of spirits that God communicates directly with each one of us in our hearts, minds, and souls through various interior movements, our feelings, thoughts, and desires. However, Ignatius was not so naive as to think that all of our thoughts, feelings, and desires were caused by the Holy Spirit. Some indeed are holy desires that come from God, while others come from other sources, negative spirits, ultimately from what he called, quote, again, quote within a quote, the enemy of our human nature. So (laughs) the trick is to figure out which of our inner desires, thoughts, and feelings are from God and which are not. To help us with this, Ignatius over time developed his rules or guidelines for the discernment of spirits. Now that's the end of that part. I'll just open with saying, I think it's so important to start here. I mean, this is clearly a Christian approach. And if we're going to employ this discernment method, this teach this, Mm -hmm. this technique, then we need to discuss a few assumptions first, like he did the ones that St. Ignatius had in mind when developing this method and his works on discernment of spirits, which that the discernment of spirits is a whole other thing. It could be a whole other episode, um, from us. Yeah. Okay, so we, Michelle and I, also believe that God communicates directly with us, that God can reach and does reach out and connects with us through our hearts, minds, and souls, through interior movements. I love that phrase. I love those words. Um, And I love that they used that interior Mm -hmm. movements through our feelings, thoughts, and desires. And I have personally experienced this on a regular, pretty much daily basis. And I think it's safe to say that you have too, Michelle, right? Yeah, yeah, you can really, um, I think it's something that does happen interiorly naturally for a lot of us. But then just learning about the process as it's written out, it makes us more aware of it. And so we can become and actually probably even train ourselves to become more attuned and in tune with what's going on interiorly. So I read a book, I can't, I can't remember if it was last summer or the summer before, but it's called Spiritual Warfare and the Discernment of Spirits. And it's written by Dan Burke. And he um, talks about where these inspirations come from. So like what uh, you were reading, Lindsay, from the Marquette website, um, he talks about, you know, the good spirits, These cause what's called consolation, those good feelings that lead us to God, they lead us to goodness, they lead us to selflessness, uh, ultimately to heaven. They're sent by God and only seek our good. And if we're looking to the experience of St. Ignatius, this would be what he was experiencing when he would read like the lives of the saints. And he would come away from that and even afterwards he would experience these really empowering feelings in his soul, like interiorly. Whereas the bad spirits, um, 
Dan Burke describes as they cause desolation. So they lead us um, downwards, right? They'll lead us to um, sin or selfishness, away from God, um, anxiety, uh, whatever God wants from us. And this would be likened um, in maybe a lesser extent, but that emptiness that St. Ignatius was feeling when he would go back to his usual stories of chivalry, knighthood. Um, I think at one point he asked for romance novels, <laughs> but they didn't have any. But yeah, that just that whole secular idea too. And then also what Dan Burke included too, which I think is really important for us to take note of too when we're entering into discernment is ourselves. We can be... Um, we can influence just in our humanity what we're feeling interiorly as well. And just to be aware of that, like what are our our appetites? What are our desires at that moment? What are our beliefs? Taking into account our strengths and our weaknesses physically, how are we doing? Um, Any sicknesses that we may have. These can form what often theologians call non-spiritual consolations or desolations. So they can have like physic on a physical level, the highs and the lows. And so what I really love about St. Ignatius and his discernment process is that he really thought it was important that we first reflect on where we are and what we want in an honest way before entering into discernment so that we can know our starting place. Um, It would be like trying to find our way on a map, but actually not having that little um, marker that you are here sticker uh, and being able to orient yourself based on where you're starting from in the first place. So um, all of this introspective self-awareness, I think, is is such a key part in the discernment process that really can't be skipped. Oh, my goodness, Michelle, that is all so helpful because I'll admit too, right, like just like you and I will say that we feel those interior movements coming from God throughout our days. I can also admit to feeling interior movements coming from the other side, right? So we definitely know that. Mm -hmm. And then not to spiritualize everything, right? There is that temptation to spiritualize everything, especially if you're a new Christian, but some of it is just me (laughs) and uh, I'm very flawed. (laughs) So some of it's just because I'm tired or I'm hungry or I have a temptation to sin and to pleasure or my, um, my appetites are out of order they're disordered. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. making sure that we are incredibly self-aware, which has been our underlying theme through this whole season, right since September, um, yes. is this type of self-awareness, right? Um, now, mm-hmm. the next thing on the Marquette website is it goes into the three distinct times or situations for dis- uh, for decision making. And I'm going to read this exactly again from their website. Now, it says, Ignatius observes that in making an important decision, we tend to find ourselves in one of three basic situations. We tend to either one, feel inner clarity or certainty about what to do, or two, we feel inner conflict about what to do, feeling pulled in different directions. For example, feeling drawn to both religious life and having a family. Or number three, there is not much of anything going on inside and we feel clueless. If we find ourselves in the first situation where we feel inner clarity, we're lucky. Then we know what to do and we just have to go ahead and do it. If we're not so lucky to have this inner clarity, and we're often not, then Ignatius gives the following suggestions to help us make a good prayerful decision when we're feeling conflicted and uncertain. Now that's the end of that passage from markhut.edu. So I broke them down again into these, these three things like he did there, Michelle. And um, so the Mm -hmm. first one with feeling inner clarity or certainty about what to do. Okay. Like this is, and I'm being honest here. This is actually the most common thing I feel. Um, I get impressions almost immediately. I wrote impressions in in, um, quotes because I'm still unsure of of that context as a Catholic, but anyways, I get impressions almost immediately in any situation. And my gut brain connection is pretty finely honed after years and years of practicing Mm -hmm. this act of trusting my gut and then looking further into whatever the situation was. And then I draw connections between fact and and feeling. I examine things over and over again. And this practice of drawing connections again between fact and what I was feeling have worked my intuition like a muscle. And I feel like it's actually the strongest muscle I have. It's not my abs or 
my arms are <laughs> it's my it's my intuition yes. <laughs> <laughs> now it takes jason longer to make a decision but we have learned that if we both feel clarity within the first 10 minutes af- after we we're talking about something um then we are making the right decision uh we lean heavily on the sacramental graces of our marriage in trusting that co-interior movement. We feel it at the same time sometimes. This this feeling of mutual consolation when we both feel clarity and conviction about something. And again, this happens about 10 minutes into a discussion. Like we don't actually have to go through all the steps of, of discernment. Um, this is that that feeling that we get pretty clearly. Now, when we feel that we have learned, and again, Jason and I have been together for 22 years, but when we feel that we have learned to move forward with something, even if it's a big decision. So yeah, that first step seems to be the one I can do fairly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like what you were saying too, about it's something that over time, especially when it comes to you and Jason making those decisions together, that it's something that has developed over time. Um, I know I feel like for me, it's not quite as common, although I do, I I think we all can think of situations where it's been like very clear after a very short amount of time what the right decision is. And I think that's a grace. But the one uh, word that you said in there that I thought was so important to this first step to remember is actually trust. Mm. I think being able to tune into that grace of immediate clarity or certainty about what to do actually has a lot to do with trust and faith. Um, Because so often, like the decision to not make a decision is a decision in and of itself. (laughs) Uh, And that uncertainty, I think, is just... Yeah, it's not being able to completely trust, in our case, that God's got this, ultimately. Like, if you have an impression, as you said, about what is the right thing to do, I think it's probably more pleasing to God to trust that feeling, to trust that grace, Mm. and to move forward on it. And even if it's not quite right, or it needs to be tweaked, or maybe you were mistaken once in a while too. I believe that that grace Mm -hmm. and that comes from that trust in God will write it somehow. Right. And to, to live life in such a, a, an inner clarity is actually a really beautiful testament to trust. And you know what? You're so right because that trust is not just a blind trust, which we have sometimes, but it is a trust based yeah. on years and years and years of experience and being really reflectful and really contemplating all of the times, every time that God has come through for us. And so I yeah. keep all of that stored within me, right? In that moment of knowing that when our end goal is to serve God, Um, that is always the end Mm -hmm. goal. And we will talk more about that through this discernment process. There is no other goal. Um, and sometimes we put that, um, out of order, but that if I know that my end goal is to serve and glorify God to then grow in holiness and sanctity as through the process. And then I know every time he's come through for us, I can quickly use that, draw on that well of past experiences to, to go forward and trust, like you're saying, and knowing that even if it doesn't work out, which it hasn't sometimes, um, Mm -hmm. that it ultimately in the big picture will work out because my priorities were right, right from the beginning, which again, we will go into as we get into the steps of discernment. So this second time or situation that we may find ourselves for decision making is when we feel inner conflict about what to do and we feel pulled in different directions. Um, and then the the website says, for example, feeling drawn to both religious life and having a family. And I, I laughed when I read that because whereas you're like number one, I really felt number mm. two. <laughs> like, mm. um, And I think that not in a bad way. Like we kind of briefly mentioned before that often the decision making comes down to a good and a good choice. Which one's better? It's not like right versus wrong is much easier to do. But I mean, even in that example, Mm -hmm. like religious life or having a family, well, those are really both really wonderful options. (laughs) Like, what are you going to choose? And I remember an actual situation I had when I was, um, I think, newly married. Uh, I was working in youth ministry at our parish and I was chatting with uh, my priest and I mentioned to him, I was like, I, Father, I think 
I have two vocations. And he was like, really? <laughs> He's like, tell me about this because I'm already <laughs> married and all those things. Um, and I was saying like, well, I feel <laughs> like <laughs> you can just say he was very kind and humoring me so that I can get it off my chest. But I was explaining to him that at the time I felt very called to ministry. I felt very called to like even more ministry, possibly like more missionary style. But I also just had like twins. Uh, and a two-year-old at home. So <laughs> um, I wasn't sure where my energy should go. I was like so confused. And he was so kind and he explained Wait, you to had me. energy? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, somehow, somehow. Or I felt like perhaps doing more would give me more energy, like um, <laughs> energy begets energy. I don't know. <laughs> but he... <laughs> But he very kindly explained to me that we really just have one vocation in life. So it's probably um, the marriage one at this point for me. And that uh, I should go read Story of a Soul because St. Therese had similar, mm -hmm. <laughs> similar thoughts. And so when we talk about the lives of the saints in particular to this second situation for decision making, I think that St. Therese would be a good one to call upon. Um, she, the whole second half of her autobiography, Story of a Soul, is actually just letters that she wrote her sisters who were also nuns. So she was a Carmelite nun, which means she was cloistered in a convent and had no dealings with the outside world. And her sisters were the same in other convents sometimes. And she would write to them about this deep desire she had to now be a missionary, which as you read it, you think, but you've taken vows to be cloistered from the world. And yet she wanted to travel to, you know, all the other countries to spread the good news and the gospel. And how do you square that within her vocation? And so um, I think she's a great saint to to call upon when we feel pulled in different directions and especially when it's in different directions that may be a good and a good because that can be a really hard situation to be in and to have to make a decision. Okay, so the third situation um, where you might need to use this kind of discernment is there is not much of anything going on inside and we feel clueless. Now, Immediately, I was like, well, this doesn't usually happen for me. But actually, clueless for me means that I have too many thoughts about everything. I'm not like frozen in indecision. Um, I actually mm -hmm. have so many, but I'm running through so many different scenarios. And I just recommend going back to our imagination episodes if you want to hear just how wild my brain goes when it's trying <laughs> to make decisions. Um, so I'm clueless in the fact that I'm overwhelmed with data and information and that. But you can be the other way on this one where you just, your brain goes, nope, I can't do it. They're just, you know, can't even go there, can't even think about it. So it's this idea of being clueless. So what if you aren't feeling like God is steering you in one direction or the other? What if this is something still new for you? What if you are a new Christian and you're still trying to be like, is that God's voice? Is that not God's voice? Is that my voice? This is all brand new for us. Well, Ignatius gives us seven attitudes to work on before we start the discernment process, a process that would be most beneficial for this situation. So we've already gone through three times where we might need this. And now we're going to like the pre-discernment process process. Yes, the pre-process. Um, this is one thing as well that we're discovering about the Ignatian um, discernment process that I actually really enjoy. There are so many contingencies to this. It's like <laughs> um, you could start, there's so many steps that there are steps to the steps, right? Yes. <laughs> it's like, um, but that they're all so necessary because um, in order to be able to do some of the later like actual decision making, you do actually have to go through all these preliminary stages. And um, we didn't mention before, but this is going to be part one of a two part series on discernment mm -hmm. because this whole first section is about this pre process that we're talking about, like making ourselves in a position where we can make good decisions because then St. Ignatius does actually have like more practical tips to go through that decision making process but I do love that once again like the church is so holistic it considers the whole mm. person not just bits and pieces yes. of our humanity we are so all in all, right? That like you have to do groundwork first. You have to be self-aware. You have to be, um, you know, 
good with the place where you're starting from and making decisions. And once that is done, then we can get into the nitty gritty and the details. So all that to say, we digress, but here are like some of that pre-process then from St. Ignatius. And I'm still laughing thinking about how much work this is. Like, again, it's taking two episodes, all of this work for the discernment process versus him just on the donkey. Like, (laughs) I'm still laughing about the donkey, where it's like the two-step discernment process versus a two, we're going to have like two hours of his discernment process here on the podcast. So, okay. So these are the seven attitudes or qualities required for an authentic discernment process. Now I'll talk about the first one. And the first one is open openness. I love that the process starts with this one. It seems so obvious, doesn't it? Um, Be open. Mm. Okay, I am. But are you really? <laughs> this article that we are referencing again and again from Marquette University really breaks this down though. And they suggest that this is where attachments can become problematic. Like, are we approaching God with whatever we need to discern? pretending to be open. Again, I am very good at convincing myself that I'm ready to do all these things and that I'm open. I'm really good at lying to myself. Are we asking God to share his will for us while we already have a plan in our hearts, a desired outcome that we are already attached to? We have to become totally detached from everything, from the potential outcomes, from what attracts us in one direction, etc. If we are going to have the proper attitude for approaching this type of discernment process, it's the help me God, but I've already got my mind made up issue. This is a huge stumbling block for me. And I can see how if you don't get this one right, there's no way that you can proceed to the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, talk about getting stopped right at step one, eh? <laughs> like that's <laughs> how I feel sometimes too. It's like, Lord, help me make a decision. But what I'm really asking for is like, Lord, bless my decision. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. Give me your blessing because this is what I actually want to do. <laughs> but if you are good with step one, then you can move on to step two, which is generosity. And in order to be open, I think we really have to have that disposition of generosity to God, um, basically meaning that like we don't place those conditions to our openness to him. It'd be like um, the spiritual equivalent of signing a blank check to God, right? Like mm-hmm. just leaving the amount blank and letting him put in the details afterwards. So the definition of generosity is just the quality of a person that compels them to give more of something than what is necessary or expected. It's a quality of like above and beyond. So we often describe God as being generous towards us. He's generosity itself. And our very existence and lives are a testament to his generous nature towards us. So in this discernment process, I think we are called to imitate this generosity back to God. This giving more than what is strictly expected of us and to truly not expect anything or any outcome of our discernment apart from where God will lead us. And that's where I see this uh, generosity really coming into play. And then the next one is courage. Now, Michelle, you and I were chatting this week about Abraham moments and how everyone is going to encounter a radical Mm. test of obedience at some point in their lives. Now, if you aren't familiar with the Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac, here's the quickest version ever. Um, Abraham and his wife waited forever for the blessing of children. They were very old when they were finally blessed with a son named Isaac. He was truly an answer to prayer. And then God asks Abraham to sacrifice him. Now, this is a prefigurement of Jesus and his sacrifice. And it really is a challenging story in the Bible for us to get our heads around. But Abraham is obedient and prepares to sacrifice Isaac, but is stopped by God and a scapegoat, a ram, is offered in the place of his son. Okay, so one of the takeaways from that story is, are we willing to do the hard thing if that is what God is asking us to do? So much of what God has asked Jason and I to do together as a couple and individually has been very countercultural and has required great courage from us. And I'm not saying that in a prideful way. Uh, We learned really early on that if we are going to have to take that narrow path and do things God's way, then these things required great courage. And then God would also provide that courage. 
that if we surrendered to him our human feelings of apprehension and worry, he would fill us back up. Um, it's very much the Marian response, her fiat, the be it done unto me according to your word moment. Total surrender takes massive courage. Mm. Wow. Total surrender takes massive courage. Yep. I'm just going to get that printed <laughs> off and hang that all around my house because, <laughs> wow, it's so true. <laughs> but you know what that, um, what that will lead to then is into the next step when it talks about interior freedom, mm. right? Like you have to have courage to let things go then in your life like the control factor in mm -hmm. so many of our lives holding on so tightly um, actually enslaves us right and it can seem yes. scary to let go of things that we have direct control over but if we have courage we can move on to step four in this interior freedom so it's actually god who gives us the interior freedom and to take from another spiritual author, Father Jacques Philippe, um, he's the author of one of my favorite spiritual books, which is Searching for and Maintaining Peace. Well, he wrote another book called Interior Freedom. And even just the dust jacket, is that what it's called? The book cover? Mm -hmm. Dust yep. jackets, right? Yep. Okay. Um, even dust jacket is striking. And it says that interior freedom leads one to discover that even in the most difficult circumstances, we possess within ourselves a space of freedom that no one can take away because God is its source and guarantee. Without this discovery, we will always be restricted in some way and will never taste true happiness, end quote. And so in another treatise that he wrote, St. Ignatius um, also says, also talks about this, uh, and that essentially the only thing that we really have is our liberty. And thus, out of gratitude, he says, we should give it back to God. Um, and so how does this relate to discernment? Well, in the article from Marquette.edu, the author describes three types of people when it comes to responding to our interior freedom and their approaches to it. So the first type of person is like all talk and no action. They have the best of intentions, but they lack the courage to follow through, or they're so distracted by their busyness that they keep putting off what they're discerning is God's will. Now, the second type of person does everything but the one thing that's necessary. <laughs> but St. Ignatius explains that this is essentially putting conditions on God. Like this second type of person, they'll do good things as long as it doesn't ask too much of them or ask them to do, um, like take the other path. Like they already have the idea in their mind of what they want to do and God's calling them in a different direction. And they're kind of doing all the good around it, except for making that final call and going with the voice of God. Their spirit is still restricted, as Father Jacques Philippe would say. And so this obviously is an impediment to interior freedom. And then the last type is the ideal. The third type of person is the one who totally is free interiorly to be able to give that generous yes to whatever God is calling them to. And they come at it with no conditions or reservations whatsoever. And they're not plagued with worries or doubts or any sort of thing. And so this would be the interior freedom that we need in order to hear God's direction clearly in the decisions we make. I just love that, that paradox of this idea of total surrender to God, right? It just reminds me again of my early pre-Christian days of just not being able to understand how a surrender to, to me, this imaginary figure up in the sky who could totally control my life and all of his tight rules and all of these things, how that could result in freedom. But I get it now because I experienced that. I don't, I'm not totally there yet, but I have glimpses of it within myself that I never felt before I was a Christian. And so it's just this incredible paradox mm. of paternal love, where when you do trust totally and you actually give over so all of your decision-making power and surrender it to him, um, that you do feel totally free. And it's just, it's such a beautiful gift. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one is a habit of prayerful reflection on one's experience. Now, this is another huge wake-up call for me because the message here is how can we listen to what God is calling us to if we aren't praying in silence for at least 20 minutes a day? 
Now, of course, God doesn't require Mm. that time from us, right? He's not looking at his really nice God watch and thinking, where's that 20 minutes from Lindsay? I can't connect with her unless she gives me that. (laughs) But we need it. Like he doesn't need it, but we need it. We need to quiet our own hearts. We need to be intentional about setting time apart from our days, our regular chores and duties, because it changes us. It doesn't change God. It changes us. It reminds us that this is important, that we are giving God our full attention even if it is just 20 minutes, we've carved out that time. Now, the Marquette article says that if we put ourselves into God's presence, now God is omnipresent, but there is a subtle but critical difference here when we intentionally place ourselves into his presence. Now, the article goes on to share about the key method of prayer that Ignatius recommends for this step, and it is called the examine. We have talked about this on previous episodes, but it's so important to keep talking about and utilizing this extraordinary tool, the examination of conscience. Now, there are many different manners and methods of this prayer, and this is not really the one you would do before going to confession. This one is more general. So in his examine, you start with an awareness of God's presence and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you in a prayerful way to reflect on your day. Then you meditate on how God has been present throughout the day, the events and feelings that we experienced. And then we ask ourselves how Christ has tried to call out to us through those feelings and experiences during our day and how we responded to him. And then you consider what you're grateful for that day. And what bothered you? Reflecting on these patterns will help point you towards God over time. That goes back again to this being a muscle and that when you start to practice these things over and over again, it will come more naturally to you as you learn how to discern. Then you thank God for your day. You ask for his forgiveness for your failures to respond to his call. Um, That's what sin really is, is as our failures to respond to him. He's always there, but what have we done on our side to, to impact our ability to relate to him? And finally, we ask for his help for the upcoming day so that you can generously respond to his call. We're always given a new chance. Well, I guess until we're not given a new chance and it's all done, but every morning you can be (laughs) thankful (laughs) that you have this next chance. So if it all seems like too much right now, all of those steps, and you're like, I just can't with all of that. And I can't write it down. You can simplify the examine by just reflecting on what he called God moments that happen that day and then how you responded to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit like the five and five yes. that we talked about, like in the very first episode of our season, right? Yes. <laughs> of, um, yeah, just remembering five things we're thankful for that day and then five ways that we can look back on and reflect that God was mm-hmm. guiding us, leading us, speaking to us throughout the day. So I love that. And one of the things that I could see this habit of prayerful reflection doing is making really clear to us what our priorities are, right? Mm -hmm. And the sixth step um, is having our priorities straight. (laughs) This one's so blunt. And I just really love the wording both in this and then also the the website of the marquette.edu. It calls St. Ignatius's spirituality a, quote, ruthless logic, end quote. And it's so true in this one, right? Because in a nutshell, what all this really boils down to and what we so often want to avoid sometimes is knowing the one thing that God wants for our lives and then orienting every other thing in our lives to serve that purpose. And what is that one thing that God ultimately wants for us? Well, Essentially, and this is straight from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's to know God, love God, and serve God in this world and the next. So heaven, heaven is the goal that God wants from us. This is the priority, and this is the one thing necessary. Um, It's going to take a lot of courage and careful decision making sometimes (laughs) in our lives and some really hard calls. And I guess that's why you need all these like previous steps, particularly courage (laughs) to make it to like having your priorities straight and then acting upon it. So uh, from St. Ignatius's spiritual exercises, he says, uh, quote, in coming to a decision, only one thing is really important. 
to seek and to find out how God is calling me at this time in my life. God has created me out of love, and my salvation is found in my living out a return of that love. All my choices then must be consistent with this given direction in my life, end quote. So like, that's the ultimate priority. And from there, I could see like, if that's the one thing guiding everything in our lives, the, what I'll call like secondary human priorities, will just probably all start falling naturally into place. Yes, that totally makes sense. And that perfectly leads into the last one. So like you said, the ultimate goal is to know God, love God, and serve God. And so that is the goal. And so the seventh one is not confusing ends with means. Now, the way the Marquette article explains this one is that when we are focused too much on the end goal without seeing God in the process, we are putting God into second place. The article says, quote, A person like this, in effect, puts God into second place, only wanting God to come into their lives after first choosing what they want, end quote. So let's say a person has decided on a career, and this career is a good one. It's a good choice, and it will be financially rewarding. And only after they've made this decision, then they think about how they can be charitable uh, with this job, with their income. Often we've reached our decision pertaining what our end goal is based on our own disordered and self-centered attachments. And let me just clarify again, when we use the word disordered, we mean it literally as out of the proper order of things. And then we try to fit God in afterwards, but we need to involve him right from the beginning. Only after finally scrolling to the end of this article did I see that it was actually written by Father Warren Sazama. And so let me give him all the credit here. But he ends the article with this great reminder that God wants us to be happy and will lead us to a place where joy, fulfillment, and happiness are available for us to enjoy. So this one is a bit confusing. But again, if the end goal is to serve God and we have that in mind, then we invite him in at the very beginning to say, how then? What path would you like me to take so that Mm -hmm. I can best serve you? We don't choose the path and then figure out how to serve God through the path. We involve him right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you know what? After going through these seven attitudes or qualities that are required for a proper discernment process, an authentic discernment process, I think is how it's described, you can totally see that it may take a lot of work on the outset, especially if it's something new for us, but that ultimately is going to lead to much easier decision making because all of these things working together, the trust in God's goodness and that he wills good for us, he wills happiness and joy and peace for us, the courage to follow through, the already having your priorities um, straight, all of these things all together, then when you have a major decision, let's say that you need to make in your life, you're already right there. And so the next steps then that follow in order to make a good decision, that's when I think that we can become those people who have that clarity that we talked about earlier, that instinct, that God instinct to what is right and how to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to him. And so all this to say, this I think will conclude part one of the discernment process. And then next week we'll dig into part two, which will focus on some of the more detailed aspects of the decision-making process as outlined by St. Ignatius in his spiritual exercises. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? I have been on a big France kick for a while now. French music and movies, and I'm almost done reading Les Miserables. And I have fallen in love with a show on Netflix called L'Agence. Now, the English title is The Parisian Agency. Have you seen come across the show yet on Netflix, Michelle? No, I haven't. Okay, so it is a reality style show that revolves around the real life of a Parisian family, a mother and father and their four sons, three of whom are adults and the last one is 16, and their grandmother who they call Majo, who lives next door. Now they become unlikely real estate agents selling very expensive properties in France after the mother kept helping the parents of her students, um, she was a teacher for I think 23 years, um, find places to live. They kept asking her 
to help them find places to live. And then she quit her job in teaching. And then they she created this luxury property business mm. with her husband. And then as each son matured, they joined the family business. Now, it is in French um, with subtitles, which my family loves because Jason is bilingual. And we complain that we don't use French enough in our home. And so this gets us all kind of speaking a type of franglais. And that's yeah. <laughs> uh, Frenchified English for our non-Canadian <laughs> listeners out there. Um <laughs> So for about an hour after each episode, we're all (laughs) trying to speak in French. And Jason has loved hearing some French vocab and phrases that he hasn't heard in years. So we're loving that. And then it's stunningly shot. The family is extremely lovable and supportive Mm. of each other. And you get this glimpse into expensive Parisian real estate, which is just so delicious. Now, I have only watched four episodes, so I can't vouch for the appropriateness of the entire series, but have been really happy with what I've seen so far. But again, use your own discretion as I will be as I continue to watch it. But yeah, French, high end real estate, great family, supportive brothers who love each other. It's just a really, really fun, like summer show. Yes, I love that. That sounds like everything that I want right now mm-hmm. in a TV show. And like, does that even tie into like your tip of the week, like champagne uh-huh. and <laughs> French and Les Mis and the Parisian agency? Like you, yeah, like take <laughs> me with you to Paris. I'm here. I'm here for it all. <laughs> so what have you been loving this week? So I have been loving a documentary that Phil and I watched last week called Desert Runners. It is exactly how it sounds. It's about people choosing to run races in the desert. And I'm starting to notice that I have this tendency towards extreme sport or adventure (laughs) documentaries, which is hilarious because I know I will never do any of these things. (laughs) I was going to say. I digress. There is a theme. You yeah, do tend yeah. towards these dogs. And I didn't know if it's Phil choosing these or if you guys reach a mutual decision or if you're um, <laughs> wanting to watch them. But you do say, seem to watch a lot of these documentaries. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, I am personally very drawn to them. And when we were dating, Phil and I always, every year we went to something called the Banff Film Festival. Um, Banff is in Alberta. And the Banff Film Festival, um, basically, it, it features these sport and extreme sport adventure documentaries from all over the world. And they would like travel across the country and have showings. And so where we live, one of the local universities always hosted them every year. And so Phil and I would go and I loved like everything from rock climbing documentaries to like these style of like marathon races and stuff like that. And yeah, it is definitely different because that's so not me. It's so not my actual personality. But All this to say, I digress. Desert Runners is a film that features a group of non-professional runners, and they've entered into what is called the Four Deserts. It's an ultra marathon challenge of four 250 kilometer races across major deserts around the world. So it has, um, they run through the Gobi Desert in Western China, the Atacama Desert in Chile, the Sahara Desert in Egypt, and then the, and then Antarctica. So all of these races, they can be run separately, but some people choose this four desert challenge, which means they run all four within one calendar year. Now, what I loved about this documentary is the combination of learning about the deserts themselves and about the backstories of all these runners and then watching them persevere through the challenges themselves. Although sometimes when watching the more extreme portions of the race and how difficult it was for some of the runners, I was just sitting on my couch wincing and I'm like yelling at the TV. I'm like, you can just stop. It's not worth it. (laughs) And that's my approach to sports. I guess that's my (laughs) my testament to my non-athleticness. But there there is, though, I have to say there's an occasional swear word that pops up, which in this context is a little understandable given the conditions of the races, but just be (laughs) forewarned about that. And otherwise, it was interesting and it was an inspiring documentary that I'd recommend if you're in the mood for a film that highlights the strength and perseverance once again of the human spirit. Is it okay that I'm not in that mood? (laughs) I just want to watch fancy apartments in France. (laughs) Well, do you know what's funny is that we often talk about how social media gives us the impression we've been social. 
when really we haven't necessarily been. And mm-hmm. I feel like for me, maybe I watch these documentaries and I feel like, whew, that was a good workout. But I haven't actually done <laughs> <laughs> any of the things. So <laughs> we can delve into my psychology of why I like these documentaries so much in another episode, maybe. <laughs> Michelle, wait, 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 wait. Guess what? Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so mm-hmm. we finished recording. Mm-hmm. I made a bowl of ramen. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to finish the fourth episode of that <laughs> Paris agency <laughs> show I was just talking about. And because I was nearly yes. at the end of the fourth episode and I'm eating my ramen. And then all of a sudden they were hosting a party for a woman who was a client of theirs. Um, they're hosting at their apartment. She's a lingerie designer, a French lingerie designer. And they did a lingerie fashion show at their apartment. Um, so I just wanted to give that extra. So it came out of nowhere, Michelle. I really, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just want our mm-hmm. listeners to know to really use their own discretion, maybe just skip past that part. And I really hope the next episodes are just as wholesome as the other ones were. Yeah, totally fair. And you know what, when we're recommending things like, like this, it's just kind of pop culture. Like it happens. It's happened to me before too, where like I've recommended something and then like two days later I'm continuing on and I'm like, oh darn, (laughs) something I did not expect (laughs) popped up out of nowhere. So (laughs) we ran back upstairs to re-record this additional um, warning, like warning. Yes. And um, so yes, great show. Be aware of that scene and we will keep you posted. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at mmsachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at lindsayhomemaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week and we will see you next time.